Good morning, everybody. I hope you had a great week this week. Thanks for checking in for our Sunday School lesson. I wanted to let you know about an opportunity that you've got coming up before we get into our lesson uh, uh, to be a part of our Summer Serve projects of our student ministry. You know, we're trying to follow the guidelines we've been asked to follow as far as social distancing, and so that kind of limits the things we can do as far as taking a bus and going somewhere. But we're doing some local projects, and we've got one coming up a week from tomorrow on Monday, July the 6th. We're actually going to be doing something for our church. I've got a huge order of pine straw being delivered, and we're going to work on putting out pine straw in the islands out in our parking lot and around our church to try to do some things to take care of our property here. And Normally our adults have had work days to do this kind of thing, but with everything going on, they haven't done that yet. And we really want to try to get some of that stuff done. And I want to encourage you that if you can be here a week from tomorrow, Monday, July the 6th, we're going to try to get started that morning about 8 a.m. and we'll work until we get done. Hopefully we'll be done before lunch. But if you can come by and give us a hand putting out pine straw and doing some things working around the church, I'd love for you to come and be a part of serving because we we need to do our part as members of this church, as a student ministry, and this is one way we can do it. So I hope you'll think about marking your calendars, and I'll remind you about it as time gets closer. So our lesson this morning is about Jesus healing a man who was born blind, and we're going to be in the Gospel of John today as we read our passages. So let's take a look. We're focusing in John chapter 9. Let's start reading in verse 1. Here's what the scripture says. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Let's get down to verse 29, and here's where the Pharisees have found out about this man's healing, and they're questioning what all's going on, and they really don't like this Jesus guy. Let's start in verse 29. Here's what it says. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Then look down to verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him saying this and asked, What are we blind to? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. So we need to break down these verses. But the gist of the story is, this man has been blind from birth, and Jesus heals his blindness. Let's kind of look into that. You know, some people are colorblind, and they can't see certain shades of different colors. Our own pastor, Brother Mike, struggles with this. And there's been a couple of times where I'm pretty sure Anita gave him a shirt and told him it was one color and it was actually another color just to mess with him. But colorblindness can be very difficult. If you can't differentiate between colors, think about how rough that would be. Well, you know, modern technology has really helped a lot of people who suffer from colorblindness. There's sunglasses that many of them can actually wear. And when they put the sunglasses on, it filters light in a different way. It allows them to see color. And I've seen a couple of videos of that, and it's pretty cool because when people see color for the first time, colors they've never really been able to know what people are talking about. I mean, they're, they, they light up. They're so excited. Think about somebody who had been born blind, who had never seen, and how excited he would have been to actually be able to see for the first time. 
I can remember in my own life, I got glasses when I was in third grade, and I remember walking out of the, the optometrist office and looking at the trees and saying, Dad, those trees have their own leaves. Because before, to be from far away, it just kind of looked like a big blob. And so it's an excitement to be able to see when you've never been able to see before. But there's a deeper point here than the physical ability to see. This is going to speak to our spiritual inability to see God for who he is. Because of the spiritual blindness, we suffer because of the sickness of sin that's in this world and affects every one of us. So Jesus is going to heal this man physically, but also spiritually. And it's a picture of what he does for us. You know, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It's one of our favorite hymns in Amazing Grace. Just think about that, how true those words actually are. Let's talk about spiritual blindness. What does spiritual blindness look like? What are some of the characteristics of a person who is blind to who God really is? Well, I think that loneliness and desperation and despair would be examples. Maybe addiction or greed or just the absolute necessity to have the approval of other people. Those are all symptoms of spiritual blindness a blindness that only Jesus Christ himself can heal in us. So in today's lesson, Jesus is bringing sight not only to a blind man so that he can see, but he's bringing a spiritual view of the world because he's going to reveal himself as the Messiah, as God's son to this man. And so it's going to forever change his life. Let's talk about his story. So when Jesus comes to this man, they find this man, some of his disciples around say, okay, so who sinned? to cause this man to be blind. You know, was it his parents' sin or was it his own sin? And think about that. You know, their understanding of consequences is a little bit different than ours. They would say that because of your specific sin, you receive a specific consequence. Now, that's true in some instances for us. I mean, think about this. If you commit murder, the consequence of your murder would be that you'd be put in jail or you could be put to death. So there would be a specific consequence to your sin, to the wrong thing you did. But what about people who develop a sickness or develop a cancer? Is that because of a specific sin that they did? No, that's because of the problem of sin that's in the world. So that line of thinking doesn't always work like his followers were kind of suggesting about this man who had been born blind by saying he's blind because somebody did something really wrong. In fact, though, Jesus does give them a reason for why this man is blind. He says that this man is blind so that I can reveal who I really am through him. I'm going to make him see. And because of that healing, people are going to realize I'm the son of God. So there was a purpose to this man's blindness. But there's a lot of people in this world who are blind. And they're not blind so that Jesus can come and just heal their physical blindness. So what do we see the greater picture in this? Well, this is just, like I said, a depiction of the spiritual blindness that we have. You know, until Christ comes and lives in us, we can't see and understand spiritual things the way that we should. If you look around verse 4 where Jesus says that, you know, I am the light of the world and darkness is one day coming. To us today, that may be a little bit more difficult to understand. Because think about this. We've got light switches in our homes. Anytime that it's night and we need to see, we just flip the light switch and we're good to go. But you know, back then, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have lights like that. Uh, their extent of lighting at night was candles. You know, we've delivered a lot of firewood. And over the course of the past few years in doing that, we've used headlamps a lot because we'll deliver at night. Or maybe you've worked around your house or done something at night and you put a headlamp on so that you can see. Man, that's convenient. But think about it in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, when the light was gone, the working day was over because there's no way to see what you needed to do. And so Jesus is using that as a reference here that's saying, I am in the world, I am the light of the world, and so we're going to be able to work because of the light that I bring. When darkness is present, you can't get any work done. So when Jesus calls himself the light, think about it like this. And then Jesus says that we're to be the light of the world. And you can find that in other places. We've talked about this in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. And so we need to realize that as Christians, we bring light to this world. We allow work to be done, work for the good, work for advancing the kingdom of God. Just as kind of a side note, there's a reference to this pool of Siloam. In 2004, archaeologists actually discovered this pool. And so I always love to point out times when 
history and archaeological finds match up. And when it's biblical history and, and references to biblical places, um, I just think it's great that God allows us to have those those little chances to see that his word is backed up and is true. Now, our faith can't be dependent upon what we can actually put our hands on and walk to and see. Our faith shouldn't be dependent upon that because our faith is in him, sight unseen. It's believing in what we can't see. But I also think that God gives us those things to encourage us and help strengthen our faith. You know, it's crazy to me how just against Jesus that the Pharisees were. They actually interrogate this man's parents and try to figure out, you know, why was he blind and did was he really blind and did Jesus really heal him? They didn't want to believe what they could see with their own eyes. Just to kind of let you know just how much they did hate him, it says here in this chapter, in chapter 9, that the Pharisees didn't know where Jesus was from. But if you look back in chapter 7, verse 52, they did know where he was from. I mean, they're just looking for all kinds of ways to throw Jesus under the bus and to discredit him. And then this man who's been healed of his blindness gives the Pharisees a little bit of a lesson in theology. It's pretty sound theology, too. This man says to the Pharisees, you know, he healed me. And so if something is not from God, it wouldn't have the power to do that. And so since he healed me, he must be from God. So he walks them through this matter-of-fact theology and reaffirms that he believes that Jesus is from God. And then later in the scripture here, Jesus actually tells him, you're standing here talking to the Son of God. It's really sad what the Pharisees did. They throw this man out of the synagogue, say you got to leave. So, you know, that was a place of worship, a place where he could be with people that he loved and who loved God. But yet they throw him out and kind of tell him, don't, don't come back. Well, Jesus goes and he seeks out this man, and that's when he reveals to him who he really is which is kind of like, I'm letting you know that you don't have to be in the synagogue to worship God. That was just a big part of the Pharisees' power trip, really. They wanted to hold the power and wanted the people to feel dependent upon them. And Jesus' whole message is, you're not dependent upon any man for a relationship with God. It's solely dependent upon faith in what I am, who I am, and what I'm going to do. So Jesus heals this man, and he gives him sight, and he allows him to, to see things as he should see things not just physically, but spiritually. And that's the same thing that God does for us. When we come to know Him, God saves us from our spiritual blindness that separates us from God. And it's a wonderful thing for us as His followers. I mean, it's the gospel message. I love to end with that. I hope that you'll check in with us Wednesday night for our Wednesday night Bible study. I know this coming week is the week leading up to the 4th, and some of you may be on vacation, which is a, a great reason that we're going to be on YouTube and on Facebook. And so check us out for Wednesday night. It'll debut at 6 p.m. And then don't forget that next Sunday, July the 5th, we are moving back to just one worship service. It'll be at 11 a.m., on that Sunday, July the 5th. Still no youth Sunday school, no Sunday night, Wednesday nights. That'll be online for our Wednesday night Bible studies. And I'll still post our Sunday school online too. Don't forget to also mark your calendar for that Monday, July the 6th. If you can be here between the hours of 8 and lunchtime on that Monday to help us put out pine straw. We're going to do our best to have a, a huge summer surf project and get some things done here around the church. I hope you're doing well. I uh, sure do miss you guys and being back to the way things were. I don't know what it's going to look like even moving into the fall and into the, the spring. But uh, as soon as I get some guidelines of what we can do, I'll be scheduling and making plans uh, for our youth ministry. If you hear of any needs in our area, please contact me. I'd love to be able to set up some more projects for us to work on this summer. And just uh, don't ever forget, we've got a purpose, we've got a calling, and that calling is to advance the kingdom of God uh, in any way that he lays in front of us. And I know in these times of social distancing, things are different. But I just want to encourage you to live for him. And um, I'll check in with you guys Wednesday night. Y'all take care. Have a great week. <music>